Kia ora koutou kato, e homa, no mai, haere mai, ki te papatakaro, stay me always, bringing it to you organic, live and dynamic. Now bring me your cups. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, uncle. <laughs> and let's dip into the healing well. Now, I'm actually privileged to um, have the Honourable Tuaraki Delamere on the show today. Um, who has taken time out of his uh, his day to spend it with us on the show. And what we're going to be talking about today is a bit about his life and um, all the wonderful, amazing things he's done in his journey. And you're sitting there laughing at me. Um, and this new show and this new series that I've come up with is focusing on our totem poles, which is mental wellness, emotional well-being, and spiritual awareness and it's all focused around our tāne and our males and um, as I said we're privileged to have um, uncle, hope you don't mind me calling you uncle, uncle too. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> on the show and um, yeah we really want to focus on um, a bit about a lot, well actually the whole show is about yourself and the journey that you've been through so um, look why don't we just start with you just giving us a real quick uh, synopsis of you and your life and, um, and then we can get into the nitty gritty of it all. Okay, well, kia ora everybody um, and Jamie Po, um, pleasure um, to being on your show um, today. I am, um, my mother's English, um, she came out after war, uh, World War Two. came to New Zealand and unfortunately she got trapped on the ferry between downtown Auckland and Devonport and ended up getting married in Tengati Payako, Kitafana Apanui, um, with my home with the old man. Um, and I turned up in 1951. Dad was uh, a sergeant major at Papakura military camp and it was a big camp back in those days. Um, you know, it was a holdover from the war. I went and started off at Papakura Normal School. I was just I was just a wonder. Oh, we're the normal school. Where are all the abnormal kids? You know, must, be, must be down must be down the coast, you know, wherever Poe went to school. <laughs> hey, so, hey, Uncle. Anyway. I'm too now. Hey. <laughs> so anyway, then we went to Tauranga and I stayed there um in Tauranga, uh Miraval Primary School. Um the only only decile one school in all of Tauranga. Um, and then Tauranga Intermediate, Tauranga Boys College, and then, um, yeah, in, what, 1968, no, 67, I won the um, John Waititi, um, Hawani Waititi um, Award for the top mark in school cert in the country. I had no idea that Hawani Waititi was my uncle because, you know, <laughs> my father was of that generation like you know um, uncle monitor and all of them they didn't teach their kids anything you know because they'd been beaten out of them back in the 20s um but anyway i got that a couple of years later when the ngari moose scholarship didn't know he was my uncle either didn't know that he's actually, actually a delahonk descended from the original delamere so um anyway and then i got a scholarship to go to america um i used to, be able to jump a long way once upon a time and so I spent, I spent the next eight years in the States. Um, I got I got imprisoned 48 years ago and my jailer is still bossing me around 48 years later. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's gone down to the, um, down to the um, cherry blossom um, thing down in Featherston where the, um, back in 1944, um, there was a prisoner war camp for Japanese in Featherston, just down the road a bit. And anyway, there was a they tried to escape, and about forty of them were killed. Um, and the Japanese government put in a cherry blossom garden. And everything is really, really nice. Um, but anyway, that's where the boss has gone with one of the other mokos. And so anyway, I end up in the states. I got my bachelor's at Washington State University. Uh, we had an incredible athletics team. Um, Bunch of world record holders there as well um, from Kenya. Um, after I graduated, I ended up in the US Army. I was um, stationed at the United States Military Academy at West Point, which was an incredible institution. I was there for four years. 
Um, I competed professionally in athletics um, for a few years. Um, came back to New Zealand, ended up in Samoa for three years. I was the director of finance for the National Airline. And then back in the early 90s, I ended up at the Treaty of Waitangi Policy Unit, which is morphed into, um, I think, mean, what they call themselves, Te Arafiti these days, you know, that the government's treaty negotiating a lot. And there is where I started working on the Whakatohia claim with um, the late Karaudia Edwards. Um, and then in 96, I ended up in Parliament, Minister of this, that, and a few other things, Immigration, Customs, Associate Health. And, and, the, and one of the great moments, actually, Poe, um, you only a little, you, well, you and me a little nipper back then, but I, when the night I got elected, um, that was on Saturday night, um, Peter Tapsell came round. I was at Wahiao Marae there um, at Whakarewaru, that's where my grandmother, Tiari Wukatevri, is from, and he came down to, came round about 11 o'clock at night, you could see the next morning I was on in Auckland doing you know, Maori TV or something, whatever it was, flew back to Whakatane and Auntie Mary Delamere was there waiting for me, Lady Mary, and off to the marae down there at Fitianga. And that was amazing because there was about 200 whānau there waiting for me because they all knew I was going to go. I was going to go to Tokota. But anyway, um, did that the next morning. And um, yeah, so we had a big... Um, celebration there um, from all the whānau for me being elected to parliament and that was when was that that was october yeah october october 96 and then i became a minister on the 12th of december anyway i got an office on the seventh floor um the top floor i shouldn't have been there because i was fairly lowly ranked but Winston wanted me beside him, so I was on the seventh floor with Winston. But I wouldn't go into my office. Um, Paul East, the MP for Rotorua, Parker fellow, national, good fellow, Paul, but I said, I ain't going into that office until it's blessed. What do you mean, uh, Minister? Oh, I have to have my tohunga um, komato come down to bless it. So anyway, Uncle Spady and Auntie Emma came down from the coast and they sent one of the crown cars down the coast to pick them up they went down to emma's first and drove around to the marae at pretty younger and uncle spady's mowing the lawns he's in those gum boots swan dry <laughs> and the crown car comes up and he's looking at there what's that and auntie emma rolls the window down means yeah hey you get in the car we're going to wellington what for you know, for the blessing of the nephew's office. Oh, I thought that was tomorrow. It is your old fool. We have to fly down this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> so anyway, Uncle Spady turns the mower off, leaves it there, jumps in the car with his gumboots, swan dry, and <laughs> flew down to Wellington. Next morning at 4.30 a.m., there's about 100 and something of whānau there, um, you know, from the whānau up in Nui, whakatoa here, um, Ngati Wai Tuhorangi for um, ring or two um, blessing that lasted a few hours. And then about, what, eight o'clock. Um, well, actually, it was quite funny because uh, most of them, all the workers, mostly Parker, came in about six. And there's all these horries, eh, in the, in the main ground floor of the beehive. Oh, shit, what's all that stuff? Oh, what are these Maoris doing? Anyway, we went around into that chamber there and there were um the late you know um the komato uncle spady and uh, to kepa the late you know and auntie ember and all of them were sprinkling the holy water and then because you've got names on the seats eh? and they get the winston seat and um the crow was oh pours a whole body glass over a seat oh this father needs a lot of holy water <laughs> So we go, then we go have breakfast, you know, I put on breakfast um, and I had to pay for it, not the taxpayer, get that right. <laughs> but then all of a sudden the aunties approached me, you know, Auntie Emma, Auntie Maka, Auntie Anne, and um, Auntie Media Simpson. Nephew, we've had a corridor amongst us old people. You're the first from the coast, from our lot to go into parliament and straight in your cabinet minister. We need you to, we want you to take a Maori name. 
we'd like you to take your father's name. Because up to then, I was just John Edward Delamere. Well, um, probably if, if you remember Auntie Maka and Auntie Media Simpson, you ain't going to argue with those two. <laughs> so, well, sure, Auntie, what the hell? So anyway, at um, first week of January, we had a big um, session down the coast where I was baptized as Tōruki. And then in um, the, oh, November 27, 1999, all your uncles and aunties, Po, decided, oh, we don't like our cousin being in parliament, being picked on by those park here, so we'll vote him out so he can be free. Or <laughs> 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 anyway. So anyway, and since then, <laughs> the, last, the last 20 years, I've been an immigration consultant. Um, I do master's athletics. Um I went out to watch one was my one of my mokos taiao and while I at competing in the Auckland Champs or something, and the, and this mongrel mate um, who's now my mate from Samoa says, "Hey bro, you should try and throw the shot put with us." So I've been doing that now for six years. Um, competed in China and Australia, the Philippines, Malaysia. Um, nowhere for the last two years, obviously with COVID, but yeah, it's great being able to, to do that. Um, on 4th of August, 2019, uh, I had what they call a radical cystectomy, which is um, because back in April that year, 2019, my doc was a little bit suspicious. He uh, said, I want you to go get a scan of your prostate. So I go to get a scan of my prostate and the young lady scans it and comes back, Mr. Delamere. You have an enlarged prostate. Oh, hey, why are you looking down there? Anything else big, my dear? No. Gee, don't you know anything? Men want you to lie about that. So anyway, but uh, <laughs> ten days later. So anyway, um, large prostate, everything else small, I guess. So ten days later, I'm in getting a terp um, transurethral resection of the prostate, which is where they go in and slice and dice. The prostate to bring it down in size when i woke up um they told me they'd found a tumor on the bladder they cut that out the winners sent up the labs both were cancerous then had a turb t for more tests and then august the fourth it all came out um and actually when my results from the turb came out i read them and when i saw my surgeon he's a great fella andrew william he's a big dude you know he's He's about 38, 39 back then. He's about two meters tall. And he's Andrew. My other consultant says, I saw the results. And my other consultant says, you're going to take the bladder out, the prostate out, lymph nodes, and sphincter. I am. I think that's the best thing for you. But it's like, who have you been seeing behind my back? Your GP? No, no, no. He don't know. Shit, Andrew, my, my, my GP. <laughs> Says, what's more important? Who's that? Oh, Dr. Google, mate. I went and saw Dr. Google. And Dr. Google told me to take it all out. So then he wants to, <laughs> then he wants to calm me down and um, he says, no, no, it's all good, you know. As long as you keep me alive, that's all I'm asking for. Just go and take it all out. And I says, and Andrew, you know, you go in there and it's worse than you think. You've got to chop the dangle things off front. Hey, bro, chop them off. Tell me when I wake up. Then I'll deal with the positives. <laughs> Like I was mad. What's positive about that? Well, you know, I do athletics, mate. So at Christmas time, I'll be in the women's shop at women's discus. I'll be bloody world champion. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I'm not the world champion. I still got to compete in the men's events. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, look, you know, the, the big thing is, and actually, uh, Mihingarangi Forbes, you know, from Māori TV and TV3 or whatever. Um, she's a friend. I've known her for years. Um, she's a good mate of my daughter's. Her kids go to school with my mokos at Westmere, at the Māori unit there. And she found out and they did a um, documentary about my cancer journey. And they followed me into the theatre and all of that. And the message there, the reason I agreed is that month, um, I lost five cousins, including, you know, uh, your, your uncle Kingi, Kingi Delamere and Kawaro. And all of those five cousins 
I'm pretty sure if they'd all gone to the doctors and got their tests done earlier, like two or three, four years earlier, they'd probably all still be alive today. And so that was the message. It says, cuz, if something's not quite right with your water, water works, for God's sake, go see the doc. Oh, but they might find cancer. Yeah, they might. And if they do, you actually have a chance. But if you're a dumbass, you won't do it because you're scared they'll find it. But the time they find it is when you collapse out on the street and they send you home to die in the next month or two. So that was the main thing. Go get tested because, yeah, um, I wake up every day. Well, it was sunny, but um, I still do um, sports and things um, back in the gym, throwing, jumping, whatever. Um, I had one real bad brush um, in April. So for, for three years, I was supposed to get this um, post-cancer like insurance treatment called um, BCG, um, was where they, so right now I have a stoma. I, I won't um, frighten everyone by stripping off and showing this thing coming out of my stomach. But anyway, um, because you've got no bladder and no prostate, the urine from the kidneys has to go somewhere. So they take a piece of your intestine, join that up to the tubes, tubes into the intestine part, your small intestine, and comes out on your stomach, on, on the abdomen. And then every six months, they they squirt um, tuberculosis virus inside you. Um, and the, the theory there is that will get the immune system going to attack that. And if there's any little cancer cells maybe lurking around, hopefully you'll kill them as well. And so I had 12 treatments through to April the, April the 6th. All sweet. I had another one on April the 6th this year. It wasn't quite so sweet um, um, by the afternoon because, you know, you just go into the consulting. They got a place there in Epsom there, went home in the afternoon and by and by next morning or the afternoon, my temperature had shot. First, it gone down to 34.9, then it shot up to 39.9 and, you know, and contacted my surgeon or the um, principal um nurse there and she talked to the surgeon and he said message was get your ass off the hospital andrew's already calling them you'll be taken straight in and i was and then at 12 30 that night he hooked up on all the machines and you know all the readings and one of the readings is you know it's your blood pressure and your pulse and the oxygenation levels o2 levels and normally they're at 98 97 and I read somewhere COVID patients, when they're in there, if they go down to 80, they're, they're intubated and put on ventilators. And I was up there you know, in the 90s. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I started like couldn't breathe properly, started like feel like I was freezing up. And then the alarm started ringing and look at the monitor. I said, oh, gee, my pulse has dropped down to 38. Oh, shit, that's not my pulse. <laughs> that's my O2 levels, oxygen. And then I thought, oh, well, it was, I had a nice 70 odd years. So I guess I'm, you know, clocking out now. And that's the last thing I heard was the, um, the alarms going off. And as just before I passed out, I uh, saw a team about 13, 14 doctors and nurses rushing with a crash cart. And anyway, I woke up three hours later, I guess it was. And they told me what had happened. I had sepsis. Even I had a slight infection of the kidney squirting in all the tuberculosis virus the body says ah stuff this we just shut everything down it started shutting it all down but anyway they brought me back and they says yeah no you know we maori when we cark it and clock out we we go up there past hone harawe this place up to up to Renga there and jump off to the ever after and i went to jump there's old parker fellow the big long beard and white hair says hey bro what are you doing here now nah, you got the wrong visa, bro. Your bloody immigration minister, Chris Farfoy, he screwed up again and gave you the wrong visa. Piss off. And besides, your elders, your elders are already up here, says you can piss off because they're waiting for Prince Philip. And the pie plays uh, already, already sorted out, so piss off. <laughs> but anyway, that's all, you know, I was there for about 10 days in hospital, I guess it was, and got out and all was good at the moment. Oh, well, only one thing then, um, after I got out of the hospital about, a week after I got out of the hospital back then, we had a 21st for one of the nieces up, up at, you know, out in West Auckland there. And I went and broke my kneecap. <laughs> How did that happen? Oh, 
I walked into a low lying table or something uh, and smacked it right on the kneecap and it fractured it. So said, what'd you do that for? I was probably perving at all those young 21 year olds up on the top table, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, that was um, back off the bloody hospital again. But you know, the big thing is, you know, when something's wrong now, I don't mess around, I'm straight off to the ER if necessary, because um, yeah, if you're wrong, it's no big deal. Like, they kick your ass out, but if it's something, you you need you are where you should be, and just grateful, you know. I um, get abused by the mukals. You know, I think I told you yesterday <laughs> that you know my youngest grandson Weihanna, you know, named after uh, my grandfather Weihanna Weihanna Delamiam, and he weaponizes. I've got the stoma bag, this bag on my stomach, you know, and because Alana, she lives right out from the across from the school um, by the school crossing there's so all the kids in the maori unit if their parents are going to be late or something like that they come and stay at alana's place waiting for their mum and dad or their auntie or grandmother like the korpu kids um out at the korpu and her mokos um they're always over there and sometimes scotty morrison's kids and all of them um but I go home, eh? if I go home early, if I'm in Auckland, I'm at my office there uh, and way hunter one day, I remember he looked up, hey, Koro, you're home early. Hey, show Manu your bag. Now, <laughs> give him a squirt. He's annoying me. Because <laughs> the bag is <laughs> ruined. So. I mean, and what's great is it doesn't phase the kids. It is mm. what it is. Oh, yeah, that's whatever. So, um, but yeah, that incident back in April, that's that was the second time I thought I was clocking out. The first time, actually, when I was 13, I got run over by a car uh, um, at Yatton Park at um, Gretton. Um, I don't even know Yatton Park, but they used to play soccer there until they decided to beautify it and put all these flowers and shit everywhere. But I was lying on the, uh, you know, I was lying on the on the hill, on the slope, watching the soccer game, and all the cars would park at the top. And one of the neighbours um, has kids in there. And they took the brake off and the damn thing rolled down the hill and took me with it. But um, yeah. but anyway, I was lucky, broke a few bones here and there and ruptured a few things, but, you know, but still hanging around. Just cancelled my birthday for December. You know, we're going to have a huli on, in the first week of December uh, for my 70th. But, you know, with the COVID being what it is, oh, well, was going to be at the RSA in New Lynn, so maybe we'll do something in April, maybe if Auckland ever comes out of COVID. But, um, but you fellas are in COVID, you're in lockdown too now, eh, in Hamilton? Yeah, we are, and um, they've extended it um, due to uh, the call um, that they made with Northland. So the decision will be made on Monday, but hey, yeah. who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? I probably feel more for the Aucklanders I've been talking to. A lot of people and they're struggling at the moment they're finding it quite difficult oh it is it's, a massive, it's massive difficult we're, we're lucky here i mean it's like normal for me i mean go to the shops and want to do whatever got to put a mask on but that's no big deal whereas in auckland it's really difficult i know you know as i mean alana you know um post cousin my daughter she's an incredibly positive person but even then it's a it's a struggle because the kids are at home she's got to be the teacher and she's still trying to keep the company going because she's the boss you see she ran a coup last year and replaced me you know, <laughs> and her and her bloody brother you know they got together and decided they were the bosses <laughs> and but you know we got a little small consultancy um which is you know it's been going for over 20 years and it's great work that's people say why don't you retire what for i enjoy what i'm doing i'm good at it and yep. you know, retire and go die hell no so i'm doing that next um i'm i've been trying to keep away from jumping into iwi hapu politics but um i don't yeah. think that's working i'm getting hassled by certain people i'm not looking at you po by the way um but you know <laughs> especially from your bloody cousins um donna Niwa and um anahera anahera mill <laughs> delamine you wicked witches, those two, <laughs> picking on me. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but I'm keeping sure it. Eh? Hey? What's that? What's that? Them I'm going to send them the link. Oh, yeah. 
yeah. But but you know, talking about the hapu, you know, I mean, it's it's such an important place for us, you know. Um, but it's it's a it's just sliding, sliding slowly but surely down into oblivion. So we need to stop that, and sort of. Um, I mean, there are those out there who are not happy with Paula's um, chairmanship of it. But, you know, my thing is first, you know, Paula's got a wealth of knowledge. Um, yeah, I think we can approve a hell of a lot of things and he's there. Uh, but we've got to work out how to put in structure to assist him. So we're all involved. We're all contributing a little bit. But I think one of the first things I, I'm very keen to do is to get together a proper register of the whānau. And first, it's like right now, discussion is who is actually Ngati Payako? I mean, for me, it's um, those of us who are descended from um, Kohi Dalamea and Ngarori. Um, you know, and Kohi is the son of the original Dalamea by God Sam Peti uh, Taha. But I don't think it goes back that far because the other children link into Marae Nui, uh, Motu Whare and Omaio. But the ones at Fitianga are the ones all coming down from Kohi. But also, as Paulus says, there's also people who, however it happened, have shares in some of the land blocks down there at Fitianga. So once we define that and then build the register. And I'm very keen that all the hapu and iwi throughout the country we put the pressure on the government. You know, we do the census every five years. In 2018, one of the questions they ask is, you know, can you tell us your hapu and iwi? Now, I want that, and from, I want another question added. If you've ticked, yes, you are Maori, and you've identified your hapu and iwi, do you want to, are you happy for us to pass that information on to the people who administer mm -hmm. your hapu and iwi? Right then and there, like there's 750, 800,000 Māori. Can you imagine if everyone who registers on the census, then those details are forwarded to the appropriate um, administrative body for the iwi? Guess what? You've created the online Māori nation. And can you imagine the, the influence that Māori will have if we have a database, and I want the Crown to fund um, a database um, setup that's common to all iwi. So then becomes so easy then to contact uh, Māori. And besides th that part of it, I mean, can you imagine we'd had that now with, within this COVID um, thing? You know, they want to contact everybody. Well, that's one way of contacting them. but. More than that, it gives the degree of power and influence um, for Māori if we were all able to be on a, what becomes a common register. So that's one of my yeah, yeah. my ambitions to try and see that through. But anyway, look, you got me raving on. So, you know, once a politician, never, always a politician, never shut up. <laughs> you actually brought a really good point into play and I'm actually going to continue on with what you're saying um, with that database because ultimately just think of um, the reach in terms of all these kids that have been adopted, um, all those children that have no understanding or with their history, they could access or, or gain access to this database to actually figure out their history, their genealogy. Oh, absolutely. Um, and it makes absolute sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if you saw it, Poe and Jamie, about a, just over a week ago, week, one or two weeks ago, young, a young lady over in Australia posted um, on Facebook into the um, Delamere Fano page because oh, yeah. she'd found some stuff and believed she was the Delamere and, um, or Poihipi, actually. I think it's a Poihipi. And anyway, didn't take long before they identified who her um, father, grandfather, parents, etc., were, because she was trying to discover herself. She was raised in Australia, um, separate. I guess her parents separated or something, and um, or the father might have been, might be. I think was deceased. But anyway, she now belongs. She knows where she belongs. I mean, that's just you know fantastic. And over the years, I've come across a, a few like that. 
or even my neighbor down here uh, and behind the trees there is a little fella called ron mark and ron mark was in parliament with me back in with new zealand first and ronnie was in the last government he was minister of defense you know his dream job because mark you know ronnie was um former army he was a major um i think he's annoyed with me um because i about a few, couple of years ago i says hey bro you know ronnie because ronnie's if you ever know ron ron's really short you know if you yeah, see I'll photos of ron with when he's over overseas with overseas military and stuff you know general admiral air marshal ron mark general admiral <laughs> And I was making fun of Ronnie and um, says, you're only in Parliament for one reason, bro. What's that? Well, you know, Winston, well, Winston's short. And Winston gets to look down on Ronnie. So Winston can look down on you, bro. Uh, he, nearly, he nearly threw the coffee cup at me. <laughs> but um, yeah, Ronnie's over the back about a kilometre. So he's about, you know, he's in terms of the size of the size of the property properties here, he's almost the next door neighbour um but yeah it, you know but when he came into parliament uh ronnie didn't know who and where he belonged to he had a few details because he was adopted out him and his brother were adopted out when they're babies both into um different families um and ron was adopted into a park yeah, that raised him and um and, and he rose up into the military and then became, you know, into parliament. The other brother got put into a family with a different set of circumstances. And that brother, I believe, ended up in the gangs. Uh, and it could have been the other way around. Ronnie could have gone into that household and his brother into the one he was in. So, um, you know, that, that all comes up. But Ronnie wanted to find out who he was. So um, sat down and gave me what he had. and. Oh, hold on, I'll get back in a couple of days, bro. Because I went and had a chat with Auntie Anne, um, the late um, Anne Delamere, because she was the senior Māori welfare officer in in, Tam in, in Wellington, in Pōneke, back, way back in the 50s and 60s. And found out that Ron um, Pokapapa back to um, Ngati Patmoana, you know, to Pokatohe. So, um, yeah, and... And I says, and your closest cousin is um, oh, oh gosh, it's terrible. I forgot um, my mind's gone blank. Her first name, she's a corporal. She was in parliament. And I'll think of it soon. <laughs> and that was her cut, you know, that was her auntie. That was his auntie, actually. But yeah, we I took Ron up to the Marae there, and yeah, it was a journey, you know, and as he learnt who he was, you know, biologically, if you like. Um, so that's going back to the the register uh, is um, Jamie. I think it's so important. I mean, one of the things I want to do back at our marae there is up on the wall in the dining room. Ain't no room in Whadinui, but I want to put on um, the printers on those, you know, um, fiber glass type boards, the pocket papa. So the people can go, so the kids can go and then work out where they belong. You know, because and that's one of the things. You go, you go down the marae, usually for a tangi, um, and you know that's your cousin, but you have no idea how you fit in or how they fit in. And because I started the Whaka Papa uh, book, and a lot of people have it, but I haven't. it hasn't been updated for gosh 20 years um but i started off with by god sam because that's our eponymous parker ancestor um sam delamere was a whaler came to new zealand about 1838 on the on the whaling ship um, the mary mitchell um ended up with peti taha um and they had um four kids one son three daughters and we're all descended at ngati Paiko from the son um the kohi and so i started off with my whakapapa book starting with um giving everyone a number so number one was at you know by god sam and peti daha and kohi's number was 1.1 because he was the oldest of number one and so 
my father was 1.1.4.7 because he was the seventh child of the fourth child. Wei Hana was the fourth child of Kohi. Kohi was the first child. And so from that numbering system, um, people could work out exactly where they fitted. And then I've even got your, I'm pretty sure I got your name in the book there somewhere, Tung. Because yeah, you, so. you know, your last number is a one because because you know you're the first the oldest child of your mum. I can't remember what her number is, but it goes all the way back, and your grandmother Polly all the way back through. And to have that sort of thing, and so the number tells you where you fit, but they actually have the fuck up. Yeah. I like that. I like that the fuck up are back. Um, at least probably to my generation. After that, it gets just gets too big and unwieldy. I think. But for now, that's a immediate target to get down to the um, great grandchildren of Kohi. And then people can see where in the whānau they belong to. Um, and that's what I'm, I'm real keen on doing. The number system rather mm -hmm. than having all the names is yeah. coming down. And yeah, no, no, yeah, you, have the name. you have the names, but everyone, you know, gets a number as well because then you can go around, you know, whether you're Tuakana or Taina. Look at your number. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> Actually, and what's good about that too, um, and I've spoken to a lot of people, and when they don't know their history and their background, there's that sense of, um, um, and disruption is probably the wrong word, but for some people it can be quite catastrophic for them because it's just the unknown. And yeah. having something to go to in a place, and in this case, that registry just makes more sense. And it's bringing all the iwi, uh, the iwis together to actually try and work in unison with one another. So it's it's coherent, it's consistent. Mm. So then, a lot easier to manage and actually figure it out. And um, for a lot of the young men coming through, um, you know, Po and I have been contacted by a group, and they want to be. Um, they want somebody to coach them and, and help them and support them um, through their journey ahead. And what it's actually coming down to is, well, where are you from? That's yeah. the first question you can ask. Yeah. Because if you don't know where you're from, then you're actually – and look, and this is a broad um, generalised comment, but if you don't actually know where you're from, then how do you know where to start? Hmm. Well, that, that, that is. I mean, I wasn't raised down the coast. It wasn't until actually I came back from the States that I really got to know all the uncles and aunties down there properly. Um, mm. And so the reality is it's like what I've missed out on. And, you know, in some ways there's a, it's not resentment, just sadness to have missed that, missed out on that. And just recently, um, Alana's second daughter, my, uh, my Taya, she's just embedded herself completely into um, tutawaking now she wants to um, um, be a teacher at Marae Nui School. I says, oh, well, maybe I'll go have a, I'll go grovel on your behalf to Robin and Annie. <laughs> um, but, you know, she's just so filled with, um, you know, the, the spirits of, um, of where she comes from, you know, and, um, and so the other thing is what, the register is also to put out a get people we design a proper website because on the website i mean the reality is you know there's probably god there's probably a third of us of the of the whanau living over the ditch you know the whole heap you know um where you used to be yeah how come we let you back in anyway <laughs> i thought we pushed you to the other side of aussie and says Next step, we'll probably kick you into Asia somewhere, but all of a sudden you're back here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but, but yeah, in the that's day, online. What's that, Jamie? Calling. Had a calling. Yeah, no, it's great that you're back. And, um, but yeah, within the website, I mean, you can have the Faka Papa on there. You can have the traditional karakia for you know, Ngati Payako, the Fano Apanui. You can have the Waiata, the Haka. And you know, in, in such a way that people can learn it without having to, you know, drive a five hours down, you know, down Absolutely. to the coast, or whatever. And so, when you turn up there, um, you can join in. Um, but it's, it's just, 
and then you can have um, the history of some of it, some of our, you know, the massive achievements of some of our Fano. I mean, you I mean you look at you know Dr. Rachel. You know um, what a wonderful person Rachel is down there being the doctor Takaha. You know the final up and who's got over ninety percent. You know, I mean, we talk about the you know the one people having vaccinations. Yes, yeah, pro-choice, but you know that thing Maori are just way behind. Well, her and Rawiti, um, Waititi, and Louis Rabihan have got them up to over ninety percent. So, and and then you've got um, you know your your cousin. Um, oh, what? Natalie, Natalie Coates. Yeah. You know, what amazing, you know, young lady Natalie is. I mean, people don't, I mean, what for me, the big sad thing about Natalie is I was real close to her koro. He was her, he was my mentor, you know, whare kaihua. Um, for years, um, he was at, with me at the Puni Kōkiri and, um, and he just would have been just so wrapped to discover his moko graduated from Harvard Law School. And she won a massive, I mean, she was the leading force, the the, um, the appeal for um, Peter Ellis from the Christchurch crash case. You know, he spent years and years in jail and died a couple of years ago um, where he was uh, supposedly had done all these terrible, terrible things to all these little kids at the kindergarten, which I think is... I just never believed it. But um, when he died, he was appealing. Um, the typical, you know, Parker construct for appeals like that is it dies with the appellant. Well, Natalie took it on and appealed on behalf that uh, under Tikanga Māori, the appeal must go ahead because um, his mana has to be sorted out because not just because his mana affects not just him, but all his whānau. And she's not in the case now, because it, but um, she is the one that kept that case alive. And, you know, and she's a Delahonk. You know, well, you know, she's our own from, um, you know, she's your, your cousin there, you know. Um, she's Billy's daughter, um, Billy Coates. But, you know, all these stories you have of... Um, People, Ann Delamere, Marka Jones, um, you know, the the first female Ringatu Tohonga, Auntie Marka. Um, so the stories, you know, of course, Nganimu, of course, with the Victoria Cross. How many of the Rangatahi, Ngati uh, Payako, Kifitianga, know anything about that statue, the bust out in front of Rangitatai Taia? Most of them just, oh, what's that? They don't know who that person is and what he did. Um, you know, he won the Victoria Cross, the first Māori to win the Victoria Cross. <clears throat> you know, there's only six awarded in World War II to all New Zealanders, and he got one of them. And several years ago, I was just, you know, surfing on the internet, and I came across... Um, the um, investiture, the presentation of the Victoria Cross, posthumously um, to Nganimu, it was held in Rotoria in 1944. And huge, they had like 7,000 people in Rotoria in 1944. Well, you know, you know, um, uh, Rotoria is out in the um, middle of bloody nowhere. <laughs> and because, his, you know, his dad's from Ngati Poro, mum's from Momayo on the Delamere side. And so the principal, you know, kai, ko, uh, kai pai kōrero, um was my grandfather, Waihana. I wasn't aware of that, but he was the one that welcomed the governor general, the prime minister, um, to Rotoria that day. Um, and there was a recording of, of his speech in Māori and English. And all of a sudden, because he died about three months later. But all of a sudden, because I, you know, so he died before I was born, but all of a sudden, there's my grandfather, I can hear him. And that was a buzz, you know. And so that sort of thing can be on our website. I mean, we look at our various uh, ancestors out there, or even current people. I mean, that 
mongrel nephew cousin of mine, your uncle, Peter, Ratahi Cross. <laughs> Sorry if you if you get listed as Ratahi, but you know, Ratahi, <laughs> he's the most important influencing factor for kiwi fruit in this country. How many of our people know that? You know, Ratahi, you know, he he runs Seeker, he runs um Hukapak. Um <clears throat> He meets up with all the powers that be in the beehive when they want something that any of the kiwi fruit they get hold of ratahi. Um, so those stories, you know, we should have all those so we know who we are. Absolutely. Yeah. So and it's we need to be um, using the current times. It's amazing what technology can do for us and the scope and the reach. But you know, sometimes we're stuck, still stuck in the ages of um, you know having to try and work out how we can actually get this all together and to make it work, but but it makes absolute sense. Um, and to even go back to uh, what we were talking about, um, about our young males and, and, and females, obviously, but for them, it's a lot of them have not been brought up um, understanding the culture, um, the Māori tanga. They don't even know the traditions of being on, on, on a marae, and the only reason why they go back is most of the time, because this is the way I was brought up, for all the bad things and all the, the sad things like tangies. Um, mm. And you're rolling up, not even understanding who you're going to see, who you're going to respect, and, and even the family that you're going to be, you know, thrusted into. Mm. Um, so, yeah, definitely this is something that um, could be amazing and definitely yeah. help um, people to figure out who they are and where they need to start and then obviously mm. build a journey and possibly even turn their life around. Well, technology um, can do that for us. We need to use it. See, that um, Whakapapa um, book I started off, I started that off in about 93, I think it was. 90, yeah, 1992, 93, somewhere about then. And I put it out there and I got, um, you know, criticised by a few of your uncles and aunties there, Pope. You know, you, you know this is secret. And oh, this is for God's sake. Oh, you don't have any right to do that. Well, then, if you're right, you better go have a corridor with Uncle Monita. What do you mean? Yeah. Uncle Monita told me to do it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Up, you know, that's yeah, yeah. up real quick. Because, you know, it's like saying we're going to live in the dark ages and stay there. No, we're yes. going to take that technology. We're going to use it. And Terrell is a good example, you know. When I went to high school in Tauranga Boys College, there was nothing Māori there at all, other than playing rugby. There was no uh, te reo Māori, no tikanga, no kapahaka, literally nothing. And um, But today I go back to Tauranga Boys College, I mean, there's the marae there. And, and Muldoon, if you, I don't know if you've ever come across uh, Nader Glavis, Dave Nader. Um, Back in the mid 80s, 1984, Nader was a telephone operator. You know, you dial the thing, working, working, and there's the telephone operator. And Nader, she was disgusting. She upset Prime Minister Muldoon. Kia ora, can I help you? And all the front pages, Muldoon wanted Nader fired for saying kia ora. Now, you know, what's the news? You know, you know, every night on TV One, you know, um, all of the people are. Uh, you know, they're using te reo Māori and, and it's growing. It's like you take the haka. My favourite haka um, I've enjoyed watching is King's College versus Auckland Grammar in their traditional game. And the teams line up on the field. The teams don't do the haka. The school does. The school is behind them. And the reason it's just impressive because you've got a thousand kids on each side or more doing the haka is like you, you look at um, King's Auckland Grammar, and it's just not Māori boys, it's Māori, it's Pākehā, it's girls, it's boys, it's Chinese, it's Indians, and it's none of this 1960s fairy haka that the All Blacks used to do. You know, these Chinese kids, Indian kids, right into it. And that just tells me, while we've got a, still got a way to go in terms of relate, race relations, etc., Shit, we've made massive strides over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And that all goes back actually to the 70s. You know, all those 
Mongol radicals like Hone Harawira and Tona Awatere and all of them. Um, Maxine Lee. Oh, at the Commonwealth. I just thought I'd throw that in there. The, the what? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they went out on the limb, you know, and because of their efforts, you know, um, you know, and it's Sykes and all of them. So, they are the ones who pushed, made it all happen. You know, and also it's 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 no longer outrageous. I remember one of the, my most fun moments in Parliament, because even though you know I can BS my way through and you know caught it all you know in Te Reo Māori uh, for a few minutes, is I'm not fluent. You know, nowhere near it. But it annoyed me in Parliament. See, in Parliament. There were two languages, official languages. One was English, one was Maori. But there was nothing done for Te Reo Maori. He spoke in English. So anyway, I called Tuku Morgan up because, you know, um, Tuku was raised uh, in a Maori environment. He's fluent. He's a wonderful, wonderful speaker in Te Reo. He says, Tuku, I need you. It was, it was in the um, morning, I think. Uh, I mean, uh, the early afternoon or whatever it was, what, the morning session, I think. And he says, I need you beside me. I'm going to do something, bro. <laughs> he says, oh, sh shit, what are you up to? Oh, come on down. So there's only about 20 people in the house at the time because the house is normally half empty most of the time. People are doing things. It's only full on like question time usually. So anyway, there's about 20 in the house and took us beside me. And then I stand up. Um, point of order, Mr. Speaker. Ko tēnei tāku uh, pātai ki ako e, e, e te tumuaki o te whaere nei. And the, the speaker was Doug Kidd. And he could look, look on Doug's face at me. You bloody prick. What the hell, what the hell are you saying? <laughs> and would the Honourable Minister care to translate? Ka ore. And Tuku jumps up. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I can maybe I can help. The minister was asking a, um, a point of order and he said he won't translate for you. And so I, I, then I explained in, in Te Reo, I don't have to translate. Te Reo is an official language of this house. It's not my problem. You can't speak it. Um, and so it was me and Tuku. Now, there was, there was, we were the only Māori in the house at the time. Within five minutes, every Māori in Parliament MP was in the house. It took, near, I think it took an hour and a half because you can't move the discussion in Parliament until the point of order is sorted. And of course, the Speaker couldn't sort out the point of order until he knew what it was. <laughs> and none of us prepared to tell him. Yeah, but, but what happened is very quickly, um, the Prime Minister and the Speaker got together and they had a translator sitting beside the Speaker. Yeah, that was the first step. It wasn't what I wanted, but hey, that was the first step. What would happen is if if you spoke in the Maori, then the translator would translate. But you see, the point is, I say, this is bullshit. So Tuku can get up and give a brilliant speech for 10 minutes in Te Maori, and then we're going to get a translation? What? You're going to tell me this translation's got some photographic memory where you can, you can recite an exact translation for 10 minutes? You know, I want simultaneous. And that's what we've got now in Parliament now, simultaneous translation, which is the way it should be. I mean, Canada has always had simultaneous translation, you know, French and English. Belgium, I think, has three. They have German, Belgian, and French. You know, the United Nations, I actually, had one of the amazing experiences was when I addressed the United Nations um, back in 97, I think it was. And... They have six languages, which are all translated simultaneously, you know. Um, so, yeah, so that was a good thing. And now, you know, doing um, speaking in Te Reo is just no one thinks twice about it. It's just part of the natural order of things there. So that's awesome. Also, um, I lay claim to having Waiata in, in the house. 
because I was a minister, I got to be the first um, new member to do his maiden speech, do his maiden speech back in 96 or 7, whenever it was. I can't remember. It was before or after because I think it was before Christmas. But anyway, I got to do my maiden speech. When I, but, I, but see, the rule of, of parliament is that if you're in the public gallery to watch, you got to keep your mouth shut, not to say anything, and no demonstrations. Whatever you do, you'll get kicked out. So I went and saw this. I went and saw Doug Kidd, who was the speaker. Says, "You know, Doug, when I do my maiden speech um, tomorrow, whenever it was, there's going to be about a hundred of my Fano there." Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. Yeah, but see, when I finish, they're going to start singing, bro. And the rules say not allowed to. So I'm wondering. What are you going to do when a hundred horries start singing e pa Torel? I'll just sit back and enjoy it, I think. And so now, um, that's just expected. If you, Especially if you're Māori, you're going to have a waiata at the end of your speech. And we have them regularly. Um, Tutakawa Wiley was the only one who did it different because Tutakawa was the last of the New Zealand first Māori. And he says, well, oh, hell, I ain't going to follow Bloody Delamere and Morgan, Henare and Waitai. He did a haka. <laughs> <laughs> and full blood of those ngati, those ngati blows from around the corner. They were full into it. And, you know, it's, it's the diversity. And the last speaker that session for doing their maiden speech was um, Pansy Wong, Chinese, originally from China. Or Hong, maybe Hong Kong. I can't remember, but I think it was China. But she was a couple of months late because her father was very ill and died. And after that, um, then she finally gave her maiden speech. And she brought, brought in a uh, hundred plus Chinese and they all did a Chinese waiata, which is really cool, you know? So, um, yeah. So Māori, we've changed the way the house works and Park have gone along with it and, you know, slowly getting there towards the equality and equity um, that the treaty always envisaged. And and today, I mean, you know, who would have thought that a Minister of Foreign Affairs would be a female wearing a moko, moko kawai? When she's pointed, it didn't bother anyone in New Zealand. I'm sure there's a few rednecks out there that were upset about it, but by and large, it didn't raise any any concerns by the population at large. I mean, the only queries were, was Nanaya up to it? And I think she's answered that pretty well. I think mean, she's done a pretty good job. I mean, she's a bit more different than Winnie when he was Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, bring their own style, but I think she's done a great job and no one thought anything of it. No one thinks anything that Rawadi's in there with a full facial uh, moko, um, facial moko. So it's great. You know, we're slowly getting there. So it's amazing how a culture that potentially could have been lost um, has seen its way through, through um, made its way to the right next to burst itself and um, utterly history. All around the world. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Well, certainly when I was in high school, um, you know, when I left there in 1969, the prediction was is by the time I had grandkids, Māori would have just really disappeared. The language, the culture was just dying out. Well, you know, it's not, it's just going like that. And while I'm probably not going to be around for it, I would I imagine my mokos mokos, um, I, um, large percentage of children in the next generation will speak Te Reo Māori, Parkers and Māori. Um, and yeah, the Māori culture will be totally embedded um, within, within the kids. I mean, you know, all these little Asian kids, you know, I've do a dot of immigration and and I've helped bring a lot of them in and their kids I mean so many of them are into kapahaka you know see these I remember when um, Tayao uh, I think it was Tayao maybe Tiaria but 
when one of them they graduated from intermediate school down at um, at a point Shiv at the at the uh, at Pasadena Intermediate, and we went there for the end of year show from the Maori because they had a Maori unit there, and so all the Maori parents are there, and the, there's a Chinese couple came in. Oh, these fellows must be lost, but anyway, they sat down to watch, and when the kids came out, and there in the front row with the swinging hill poise was their daughter, a little Chinese girl, and she was magnificent. And mum and their mum and dad were crying, thinking, you know, how wonderful that their daughter, who had come over from China, was now fully embedded into New Zealand culture. And so, yeah, that's fantastic. No, it is, and I'll, I'll keep going back to um, identity because that can actually shape um, an individual's life in terms of the, the choices that they make. And it's we need something, again, to go back to what we talked about with that database, and we need our, our young ones. Um, mm. And, you know, the more my kids coming through, they need to know where they come from. They need mm. to know who the, mm. the tipuna were because if I had known where my history, but a bit more about my history in terms of... Um, you know, background with potential mm. military, and in your case with your cousin, um, Po Nat, um, and even yourself, um, uncle, um, with your history and the extensive, you know, colourful resume that you have, you know, why would I not, why would I not uh, immerse myself into to understanding how I can access, you know, these people in my history to then say to myself, I can actually do the same. What's yeah. stopping me? But then yeah. if I don't know that, Path could be shaped very differently. So, and we're going to see a change in the culture because the young ones coming through today are all about technology. They've got a different outlook in terms of how life should be, and the culture is only going to evolve mm. and improve better. No, I agree. I mean, <clears throat> one of my mokos, she's pretty good at you know, she's brilliant. She's fantastic in English, of course, but. She's also pretty good at Tereo Māori and pretty good at Korean. You know, she okay. follow. you know, she's in love with that, what's that Korean thing, B something or other, the pop group? BTS? K-pop. K-pop, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, um... So, you know, we can do multiple languages. I mean, I know a very good friend of mine, her children speak French, German, Mandarin, and English. And that's just common throughout Europe. And, um, yeah, so I'd love to, for all that kids to, you know, being bilingual, learn English and Tadeo, um, I think that will be more than norm in about, 20, 30 years. Yeah. Yet, when I was in when I was in school, you know, the language was dead and dying, and now it's flourishing. Yeah, it's only going to get um, it, popular. Is not the right word, but it will become popular between with the young ones because they're going to want to know where they come from in their history. Mm. They will be one out of how many in there in their class that cannot speak Māori because the majority mm. of them actually be fluent. Um, mm. I'll tell you what, Uncle, I could sit here and talk to you for hours, <laughs> literally hours, and it's been an hour already. Yeah, um, yes, I'm just checking, are you an hour 10? Yeah, yeah. So, um, but before we, uh, we close, um, if you were to, um, you know, help the young ones coming through, um, what advice would you give them? I just want, uh, yeah, just believe in yourself. Believe you can do it. And you can. I mean, I've seen kids who've gone through school, left school early. I mean, even um, Poe's cousin, my oldest boy, JP, you know, uh, he walked out of Whakatane High School when he was 16, told the principal to shove it up as you know where and went and worked for the bakery and, you know, and got to know the, got to know some of Her Majesty's um, 
places in Fakatani, you know, after being out there in Fakatani and rebel rousing, drinking, scrapping, whatever. But um, one day he put all that behind him, went to law school, um, became a, a lawyer. Um, so, yeah, you can do all that. Um, when he was, I think when he was 27, he went, he, went, he went to university. You know, he hadn't even finished high school, but he got admitted. And he applied under the um, program for, um, you know, adult Māori. And he had to be interviewed. He had to be interviewed by a couple, a couple of kuya. And he came to see me. Hey, Dad, they, they, I got provisional admittance into Auckland Law School as, as a you know, disadvantaged um, adult Māori student. So there's kuya going to interview me. What, should, what do you think I should do? Well, look at you, blonde, blue eyes. I guess you better make them laugh. <laughs> so anyway, he, you, you know what JP's like, Posey goes in for his interview. Kia ora, aunties. Oh, you know, and they sit him down and says, well, oh boy, what do you know about the marae? Oh, not much, just my own marae. Well, what do you know about your marae? Where's that? Oh, that's Fitianga down the East Coast. So what do you know about that? Oh, when they start ringing their bell, you get the hell out of there. Otherwise, you're on your knees praying for five hours. <laughs> you know, and you know what that's like. You know, you hear them laughing their heads off. And when they finish, he says, oh, that's good, boy. You're the only one. All the others coming in trying to pretend, you know, the, the, the in-depth wannabes born again in Māori. Um, and so anyway... He got into law school and passed law and um, became a criminal lawyer. Um, yeah, so it's never too late. My brother's daughter, um, Dani, Alan's daughter, Dani. Now, Dani is same age as JP, so what's that, 41? Oh, you know, 41 next week sort of thing, whatever it is. She's going, she's just been accepted into medical school. I'm exactly the same. I'm 45. Yeah. Yeah. So you're 45, what? Pushing on 15 or 16? Always, always. (laughs) Yeah, so it's not too late. Um, Uh, And so. If you just believe in yourself, you can get there. Absolutely. And um, it's a it's a real, it's a reminder though, and we have to be told and reminded quite often because, you know, society unfortunately dictates that, you know, when you do hit a certain age, there's an expectation, well, that's bollocks, I don't believe in that. Yeah, neither. But, you know, mm. it's unfortunate that you, you've got to have the right people around you to keep, to keep actually pushing you forward. Otherwise, like you were saying, if you stop working, you know what, you just stop, you just die. Yeah. You need something to go. Mm. No, just be positive. Like, you know, because I'm 70 pretty soon, and so I keep compete in the you know, athletics. And, you know, I was a lot, as you probably know, I was a long jumper, triple jumper, but that's all too hard these days on the joints. So throwing the shot put and discus, and, and the shot put, when you turn 70, they bring it down the weight. You, turn the, you throw the four kg, four kilograms, which is the same size that, um, Valerie Adams, Dame Valerie throws. And anyway, I was at the National Champs this year. I was chatting with Valerie. Hey, Val, you're going to have to watch out next year. Well, why is that? I'll be throwing the 4K. I'll be throwing the 4KG, same as you. She says, oh, what, are you planning to throw 20 metres? Nadi, I'm hoping you'll come down to 11. <laughs> 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 uh, well, she's wonderful, eh? I, I think she's just magnificent, her and her sister. But you know, Val's you're know, such an inspiration to so many people, and she always tells it like it is. I think, yeah, you know, that's the whole Adams family, eh? Mm-hmm. I like that. But anyway, look, um, again, it's great um, chatting. Um, when we come out of lockdown. Now that I know you're in Hamilton, every now and then I drive up. Most times I fly up. Um, 
So if we come through Hamilton, we'll give you a tinkle and we can meet up. Yeah. 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 Oh, definitely. Well, we want you back on the show again because we haven't even covered your extensive, colourful resume, and I'm eager to actually find a bit more out a bit more um, with your sporting background West um, Point. and West Point yeah. in particular. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, just the, just a bit of an average there, people. So West Point presidents of America have gone to the academy. Oh, that's an amazing place, West Point. Um, I went there in 74 when I was on the staff and in 76 I was there when they had a when they let girls in because West Point was just a male only school for 200 years and the girls came in the first girls they were incredible um, because every the, the men were just like oh like my boss had been I think um, he must have been there when Queen Victoria was on the throne you know he'd been there for uh, 40 bloody years and he said, oh, I let girls in here over my dead body. Because, see, the academies, all the academies, the Air Force, Navy, and Army, military academy, they have a code of code of honor, um, which is a cadet shall not lie, cheat, steal, or tolerate those who do. So if you cheat, you get kicked out. If you see someone cheating, you must report them. Because if you don't, and someone else sees that guy cheating and sees you seeing it, you have to report both of them, one for cheating, one for observing. And if you don't report it as an observer, you'll get kicked out as well. So you don't cheat, you don't lie. But anyway, so this is my boss. Oh, girls have come here over my dead body. Well, the week before the girls arrived, he had a, he had a um, heart attack and died. And I was thinking, gee, that's taking the honor code a bit bloody far. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. But, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, he was a wonderful man, eh? He was. But, um, yeah, the academy was just incredible. And those girls, their dropout rate was half that of the boys or the young men because they were expected dropout. And they were so determined not to fail. And I actually went back there in 97 I, when I was minister. I was a, like a guest of honor, and that was quite incredible, um, going back in a slightly different role. Um, but... You know, um, so many w incredible people graduated on there. You know, General Patton, um, General MacArthur, President Eisenhower, you know, about six or seven presidents all came from West Point. Um, but, but yeah, um, best job I ever had actually was being there. My first job. Oh, actually, no, it's my second job. My first job was I was the... Um, Back in '74, for about three months, I was the brakeman on the roller coaster at Magic Mountain in um, Valencia, in California. I had to, I, I, I had to make sure I caught it and make sure the guys didn't end up, you know, um, hurting themselves. And then I was in the army. Train, tra train killer. <laughs> oh, we definitely need to catch up soon because I want to hear all about it. And I know yeah. our viewers would love to hear your story. Yeah. Okay, well, time for me to cook my my um, pepper steak. <laughs> oh, yum. Look forward to having you back on, Uncle. Oh. It's been a privilege to have you on here and like so many others, including myself. Man, you've been a massive inspiration to, especially our whanau no. from up on well, that's nice of you to say that. Okay, Po, uh, Jamie, until next time. Until next, next time. time. Thank, Thank you. Bye.